Welcome to the Archive Room podcast, stories of Manx life in years gone by, told by the people who were there. Manx Radio. Fast am I, Judith Lay here, once again opening the door to the Archive Room, Manx Radio's treasure chest of stories of island life from years gone by, told by the people who were there. So, come on in, and let me take you for another gentle stroll down Manx memory lane. At Christmas, play and make good cheer, for Christmas comes but once a year. And I hope you did have at least some time of good cheer over these last two weeks. In past times on the island, the Christmas period was known as the Foolish Fortnight, beginning on Black Thomas's Eve, the 21st of December, and ending on the Old Christmas Day, which is tomorrow, the 6th of January. The Foolish Fortnight was, much like today, a time for socialising, eating, music and dancing. It was also a time for Manx customs, and who better to talk about them than Mona Douglas? Let's eavesdrop on a conversation between Mona and David Collister, talking here about customs associated with the old Christmas Day, January the 6th. We join them as Mona explains the belief that the myrrh plant would bloom at midnight on Christmas Eve, a custom first told to Mona when she was very young. I suppose I was about seven years old when I was taken to see that at a house away up on the mountain, a little cottage belonging to John Madwell Crease, a little thatched cottage, and they had a bed in front of the house with some of this myrrh in it, and John was always saying that the myrrh would come up on Christmas Eve and midnight, so I was allowed to stay up and I was taken to this thing. And I can't say that it flowered, as they say it does, but it certainly came up out of the earth. There were the buds of the the leaves and things coming up, and some of them opened a little bit and and went quite green, and it was frosty. And uh, I didn't, I wouldn't stay, didn't stay very long. I don't know how they went down again, but I should think what happened would be that the frost would wither them as soon as they came up. Yes, you would think so. And Mm -hmm. who was watching all this with you then? Oh, my parents and and, uh, some neighbours. John had been talking about it, you see, and it was all around the district and some of the neighbours came up with us to see it. Yeah. So was this, uh, this was obviously for them... A regular thing to do? Well, I don't know whether they did it every year or whether it was only because some of them didn't believe what John said and they went to see for themselves. (laughs) But anyway, they did see. I I suppose they did because I did. But you've not seen that since you were seven then? No, I'm afraid I've never gone out at midnight to look (laughs) for it since. They also used to say that the cattle did strange things. Yes, that was one thing that they always believed. All the the cattle went down on their knees at midnight on uh, Christmas Eve. That was old Christmas Eve, the 5th, you see. And uh, another thing was that uh, the bees that were fastened up for the winter, they used to come out of the hive and and, and swarm round the hive at midnight on Christmas Eve. You've not seen that yourself? No, I haven't seen that. But you will know people who have. Oh, I suppose people that I heard talk about it, I suppose some of them must have seen it, yes. Hmm. How would they know if they hadn't seen it? What other sort of things do you remember uh, from way back about these Christmas traditions? Well, another thing is connected, I think, with the old Manx name of the day, in Shanley Chibatoshche the old day of the water well, because there were an awful lot, as you probably know, of what were called healing wells in the island. They're mostly supposed to be dedicated to Christian saints now, but I think they go a long way further back than Christianity, and the old idea would be that either the well itself or the spirit of the well would do the healing, but anyway, they still call them healing wells, and on that morning of the 6th, the morning of the 6th, it was the right day to go to the well and bathe your eyes. It, it, they always said it was for sore eyes. It could be for any kind of uh, physical trouble, I suppose. Mm. But uh, they always said it was for sore eyes. And you were supposed to go to the nearest healing well and bathe your eyes in the water and make some little offering to the well. It was generally a small coin, like a penny or something like that. And some of the wells, you can see, still have things lying in them that have been thrown in for offerings. One is from Mackleswell out on on the head. 
How effective then do you suppose these things were? Was it like that the people have a sort of faith in what they were going to get? I think they did. I think if there was healing, it was probably what we should now call faith healing. They didn't have the term in those days. What other sort of traditions are there here? Well, another one, I think, is a very old Celtic thing, you know, fire was supposed to be a very magical thing in the old Celtic tradition, and there was firm belief that on the first day of uh, Christmas, the 6th of January, old Christmas Day, the, the beginning of the new year, you shouldn't give away any fire. Well, now, fire in the days when this was commonly believed would be the old peat fire of the hearth. And it used to be a thing sometimes with people in the country. I know I can remember that even on the Balladic when I was a child. If the fire went out, they would go to somebody else's house for a sod to start it up again. Yeah. But on the uh, 6th of January, the old Christmas day, you were not supposed to give the fire at all. If you let the person that wanted it have it, well, you had to charge them something for it if it was only a penny. If it was bought, it was all right, but you mustn't give away fire on that day. Mm. With the modern Christmas, of course, we know about the 12 days of Christmas. Did 12 days play any part in the old Christmas? We didn't think about the 12 days of Christmas in the island. What we thought about was the old Christmas day and the present Christmas day. And the decorations and things were probably put up for the present Christmas Day, 25th of December, and uh, they were left up, and there were still uh, Christmas decorations on the old Christmas Day, the 6th of January, and uh, they were taken down for quite a little bit after that. And the thing used to be that some of them, at any rate, some of the decorations, the holly and mistletoe and things, especially the mistletoe, you must save a bit of holly and mistletoe to burn on the fire under the pancakes on Shrove Tuesday. Is that so? Yes. Mm. Well, wasn't there also a connection with the 12 months of the year and a weather forecast. Yes, it wasn't exactly what you could call an accurate weather forecast, but the 12 days starting from the 6th of January, which was old Christmas Day, was supposed to indicate the general trend of the weather during the 12 coming months of the year. For instance, if the 6th itself was snow and that kind of thing, well, you could expect a lot of snow in January. Mm. Or if that was a mild day and the, the next day was snowy, well, you could expect a lot of snow in February. So what you're looking for is a sunny day around about the 12th, 13th and 14th to look after your summer then? Yes, something like that. <laughs> we'll have to keep our eye on this. Have you ever, ever sort of followed this through the years? Well, my grandmother always used to follow it faithfully. I'm afraid I don't, but I, I do keep a weather eye open on the on the 12 days and see what they're like, but I very often forget what they have been like by the time the corresponding month comes round. <laughs> <laughs> now, the fishermen used to have a lot of superstitions in the Isle of Man, didn't they? Did they have anything involved with Christmas? Oh, yes, they had the boat supper on the 6th of January. That was an old... Celtic play which Dr Clegg recorded, Dr Clegg of Castletown, the famous man who collected so many of the folk tunes for us and he's got the whole thing knotted down in Manx and in English in his Manx reminiscences. It was a re-enacting of the engagement and preparation of the crew to go away for the fishing. And they used to do this on land then? Oh, yes, just imitation. Yeah. But they used to do the actions and everything of uh, throwing the nets and, and hauling up the sails and everything. It made it, it's a real play. So under this old system then, the old Christmas, there wouldn't have been a twelfth night, would there? No, but the sixth was always the last day of the Christmas holidays. They didn't have anything corresponding to Boxing Day. The only thing they had was, they called it St Stephen's Day, and they still call it that round here very often. They had the Hunt the Wren coming round on St Stephen's morning, but um, on the 6th itself, 
It was the final jollification of Christmas Day and it was the big gints of the winter. Everybody went to it and there was all sorts of jollifications. They generally went to a pub for it because very few of the houses had even a barn big enough to take all the people. Mm. And they used to appoint somebody that they called a manchester or master of ceremonies and he had to appoint what they called legates. That was valentines or people that were paired off together for the gints itself and the man had to pay for the woman's supper or whatever they had then the proclamation went on that they can their legates for tonight and for further longer as they wish you see and some of them reckoned that it would be sweethearts for the year mm. sort of thing mm. and it's a funny thing but the tune in the Manx National Songbook that is now known as the Fisherman's Evening Hymn not the words of course but the tune of it uh, was uh, fitted to words by which the Manchester appointed the legates for this particular ginst yeah. it, it started and you'll see the name the Manx name of it on the title of the of the song in the Manx National Songbook, Eishu as Clashton. Eishu as Clashton, as gau shu tashtan, I listen and hear and take good heed. And then he made the proclamation of what these people were to do, you see, all in Manx, of course. And uh, that was the beginning of the Gints. But it's funny that it should now be reckoned a, a hymn tune. Yeah. <laughs> because yes. it was rather a ribald thing, you see. Mona Douglas discussing with David Collister some of the customs associated with old Christmas Day, January the 6th. And if the old way of weather forecasting is correct, let's hope that a fine, mild day tomorrow will mean we can look forward to a gentle January. Fortunately, we don't often get really serious amounts of snow on the island, which is why, when we do, they are memorable and, in years gone by, could have very serious consequences. Cyril Jones was born in 1918 and vividly remembers the severe snow of 1929 when he was a schoolboy in St John's. In 1929, I could remember it well, it was on the 11th of February 1929, and I was in going to St John's school, and it was we used to have a, an urn. The old schoolmaster had had an urn. We used to boil this for a, we could make ourselves a cup of cocoa. Yeah. And we used to go down from the school to his house, which is down by the church. And I remember that his old but guest and me going down to get this urn filled with water. And it was snowing, it, it, it was driving along, the, along the, the ground. So in the school, and we never let us out, we didn't get out for dinner time. He kept us in school till about three o'clock. Mm-hmm. And when we got out, oh, it, it, was, it was shocking. It was going down, the, we had the... Uh, Go about two miles from St John's up the road to the Hope, up the Bolivar Road, up to the Kern Hill, and it was coming down there like a tunnel. It, it, it was shocking. Yeah. We got as far as Mullen Cloy, and we went in there into the cow house, and we warmed our hands on the cattle. And then we we got as far as Bala Oates Farm. It was Leslie Lowney, my brother and my sister, mm. and, and Billy, uh, my brother Billy and Leslie Lowney. They went ahead of us. They were kind of breaking the storm for we were younger. But yes. Unless he, he uh, dropped off and he got near his place and we had to go on our own. We got as far as uh, Bola Oates Farm, the leases. We were, we've had it. Anyway, Walty Lees came out and he got sacks and wrapped around our hands and the sacks around over our heads. and We got home. I don't think we would have made it on our own. It was shocking. It was, it was terrible. So. Alec Quirk Caron lived all his life in Glen May. I've seen some queer, heavy snowfalls in Glen May. Have you? Oh my God, yes. The road, the Mullock Vedden, going up to the shop, fairly deep, and you could walk over that. Right over the hedges, you wouldn't see nothing. Well, that put a stop to you working on the fields then? Oh, yeah. I remember six weeks, six weeks, that with that hard frost, I don't remember what year it was, but the six weeks there wasn't a, a, a horse out of the stable. Yeah. What would you do on the farm when you were snowed up? Then? Well, I mean, you could clean calves' houses out and stuff like that. And uh, the cows were 
Cows will go out for water, there's no water in front of them. The cows will go out for water every day. Either that or you had to drag water to them. Yeah. And when the cow was done calving, you had to get warm, lukewarm water to give to the cow for the first three days. Yeah. And I've seen me in the hard frost taking a hack and going to the field to get a load of turnips and a hack, and you'd be hacking the turnips out of the ground. Oh, right. You'd bring them home, an old cutter, turned by handle, and you're putting hot water on the turnips to give to the cows yeah. to take the frost out of them. You're still freezing in the, in the sheds, really? Yes, uh. yes. And in Kraganation, there was no water in the house. Every drop of water was from a cooler down on the yard. Uh. And you had to go to get a bucket of water, you had to go to the cooler in the yard. Yes. Times were hard. And someone else who knew the heavy cost of bad weather on the island was Harvey Briggs. Born in 1920 and having grown up fully immersed in country and farming life, Harvey finished his secondary education at Douglas High School and became a farmer and in due course worked the land at Ballakill Martin with his wife Laura for over half a century. He always kept a diary and paints a vivid picture of farm life in the grip of bad weather. Listen now as he shares his memories of 1947. Well, it began innocently enough. Uh, the uh, back end of 46 was all right, and I think we had a, a reasonable Christmas. But sometime in uh, January, we began to notice that uh, the snow showers were more frequent than usual, and uh, there was a lot of hard frost, and that did enable us to uh, cart the manure from the midden and the sheds out to the field. Uh, we were using a tractor and uh, trailer, consequently it was dropped in the field in what we call pollogs. Oh, yeah. You know what a pollog is? Did yeah. you? <laughs> yes, David. Well, we uh, we dropped it there in the field, and uh, the idea is that you make tidy lines of it through the field, then you go out sometime later and, and spread it. Well, that was all right. We got it out all right, and there it lay on the ground. But uh, the ground was very hard. We we didn't spread it because the uh, the ground was too hard to plough with so much frost. Consequently, uh, I do remember that um, practically I think all the ploughing matches that day were first postponed and then eventually abandoned. Mm. On February the 7th, we had a severe frost and spells of drifting snow in a bitterly cold east wind. By February the 13th, the snow was covering the ground and making any animal work absolutely impossible. But uh, we spent our time cutting wood because uh, we were in the aftermath of the miners' strike in England. Consequently, there was very little coal getting through to the Isle of Man. So we were lucky here, of course, in that we had a, quite a lot of, a lot of trees. So uh, with cross-cut saws, again, before the days of power saws, mm. we were out cutting uh, a couple of men here and myself, and it kept us warm, if nothing else, <laughs> yes. and it had a good supply for not only burning for ourselves, but mm. we used to give it away to less fortunate neighbours. And this was here at Balcom Martin? Yeah. By February the 22nd, it was pretty bad, and uh, we were beginning to think, well, this is uh, worse than we were we used to, but... The big blizzard came on February the 25th, a day many of the older generation will remember by now because that day the Young Farmers Clubs were on their annual visit to Nokelo, Nokelo Experimental Farm. They used to go on a Thursday afternoon, judge the livestock there, and then uh, they would get tea with the kind uh, bedevilence of the Board of Agriculture. We used to go into Peel and in one of the cafes there and we'd have a meal and then uh, we would congregate again at night for a, a debate. I well remember I was one of the people chosen to be in the debate in Crosby Church Hall and we had speakers over from England, from fellow young farmers clubs over there and uh, we went in and when we went in, at, I suppose the meeting started about half past seven, it was uh, quite reasonable outside but uh, around about eight, uh, half past eight, somebody came to the door of the hall and said, uh, if you don't get on the road soon, you're not going to get home. 
the blizzard is closing in very fast. So the meeting was abandoned, and um, I was glad because I was very nervous about making a speech that night. But anyhow, <laughs> uh, that was one good thing about it from my point of view. But we set off for home, but the northern and southern young farmers' clubs, who were the furthest to go, they didn't make it at all. Some of them slept the night in the coaches, others struggled on to anywhere where they knew they could get a bed. Mm. And uh, they were there overnight. Those of us in the East Young Farmers Club, we got as far as Onken in one of Corkle's Ganache coaches. And I uh, remember the late Robert Corkle, and he fixed uh, some of his cars up with chains, wheel chains, and got us through because some of them had to go through to Mackle. So mm. uh, they did make the journey. That was the, really the severe weather and that covered everything. I mean, the White Bridge Hill here joining us, that was closed for days mm. because uh, there were no snow plows. Highway board had to dig them, everybody out with shovels. And what about deliveries of milk and things like that? Well, at that time, we had to take the milk each day to Onken Village. We met the milk floats, the horse floats, at uh, the bottom of the school road in the premises that now house the Onken district commissioners. I used to have to put the pony in the trap at quarter past seven every morning and set off for the village with uh, milk and churns. Mm. When we got there, it was poured into these great tall churns. And uh, mm. so uh, we, we struggled through. I do remember that my uncle and I, for about four days, we carried the milk into Onken. The milk always gets through like the post. We uh-huh. had to get the milk through. That was our livelihood. No. So the mountain road would be closed as well. Oh, of course, yes, yeah. yes. In fact, there was, there was a lot of devastation up on the mountain, yeah. eventually, as we found out later on. So that would cut off one part of the island from another, really, would it? Yes, yes, but it wasn't many days before we, they actually got the White Bridge Hill and the main yeah. roads open. But then, when did you get ploughing? Because you'd be behind shade. Oh, a long time, yes. In fact, uh, on March the 11th, I wrote in my diary, we have not ploughed a single furrow. The dung in the pollocks has been covered in snow since January. We couldn't find the, the pollocks to spread them even. So that was lying there, not not a uh, for a ploughed. Well, on March the 12th, we had a fresh blizzard. That started at 1 p.m., just when things were beginning to melt a little bit. Uh, we we get really got bad again. Mm. On March the 16th, believe it or not, summertime began officially. Really? <laughs> yes, and really it was a bit of a godsend because that day we had heavy rain and that dispelled much of the snow, mm. which had lain to a depth of six inches for months, but it had little effect really on the uh, the drifts, which still stood as high as the top of hedges. That was March the 16th, yeah. about six weeks after the first big blizzard. Really, yes. It's a long time, isn't it? But eventually uh, things did improve. That that rain took a lot of it away. And on March the 27th, this is what I wrote in my diary, today we make a somewhat uh, belated start at the ploughing. We have 36 acres in all to plough with all the following cultivation work and the task is formidable. Nevertheless, if we keep our Fordson tractor and Massey Harris plough moving every hour of daylight with the additional help of our pair of working horses, we still had horses in those days, we might manage to get the crops in the ground sometime during the growing season. <laughs> but of course, the, the, the main thing was that uh, when uh, eventually uh, the winter was over, the, the people who suffered worst were the, were the hill, hill men, the hill flockmasters. Mm. Thousands of sheep were, were lost on the Manx Hills in those days, and it took years for them to get their numbers back. And, of course, they, there, was, there was a lot of money lost, too, amongst them. But even when we did get the crops in the ground, the, the, the thing was that uh, nature's got a wonderful way of uh, balancing itself. And uh, although the crops went in the ground late, it was a good growing season and we had good crops of cereals, potatoes and uh, green crop for the next year. People said that the uh, severe weather had killed off all the bugs in the ground and uh, it was just a case of getting the seed in the ground and from then on nature made up for what she'd done in the winter. A comforting end to a very chilly story from Harvey Briggs, warmly remembered as the undisputed voice of farming in the Isle of Man. And I'm afraid that's where we have to close the archive room door for another week. But I'll be opening it again at the same time next Thursday. And I hope you can join me as we take another trip to Craigniche to listen to Doris Madrill. We'll be talking about life on the railways with Frank Downworth and meeting a few more characters from Glen May. 
If you've missed any of the earlier episodes of The Archive Room or you'd like to share them with friends, you can easily find them on our website. Just go to manxradio.com, click the podcast tab on the homepage and search for The Archive Room. All the episodes, starting with Jeff the Mongoose, are there. So, till we meet again, this is Judith Lay saying thank you for listening. And as always, the last word goes to our resident rambler, Howard Hampton. Till next week, so long, yes, sir. The Nation Station